Good afternoon, evening, everyone. It's a lovely crowd in here. Uh, I, first of all, I apologize to those among you who did not know that the School of Business is now here and not over there. From now on, you know, tell all your friends. So um, I think I know almost everybody here, but my name's Paul Lakeland. I direct the Center for Catholic Studies, and this is the second of many events this semester, and the 19th and Rami O'Callaghan Lecture. Um, I'm just going to introduce uh, Catherine O'Callaghan in a moment, who will introduce our speaker. But before I do, I want to say something that I'm not sure we've ever said before. So uh, frequently I hear from the O'Callaghan family, many of whom are sitting on the front row here, as indeed they should, um, how, how happy they are that for 19 years we've been doing this thing, right? But I don't know if we've ever said uh, on behalf of the university how happy we are that they did it. Because if you go back and look at the list of speakers we've had, it's been a star-studied group. Barely, barely a dud among them, which is, a, <laughs> which is a, a, a great thing and a great testimony to them. So, uh, so, once, so thank, uh, it's my thanks to them. So, um, on this 19th lecture day, um, Catherine O'Callaghan will uh, introduce our speaker, Tricia Bruce. And Catherine is Assistant Dean of Academic Advising at Marlborough College, which is a most unusual and very interesting college up in rural Vermont. Uh, couldn't be more different from this place, but uh, it certainly is a place that people like me sort of kind of wish, wish was bigger and we could be closer to and be more a part of. So anyway, here is Catherine O'Callaghan to do the introduction. Thank you. I want to acknowledge Paul Lakeland's leadership and thank the Center for Catholic Studies at Fairfield University for their support and care of this lecture series in honor of my mother. For many years, my mother worked as a catechist, youth minister, advocate for the intellectually disabled, and director of religious education in the Diocese of Bridgeport. Tonight, we celebrate the 19th annual Andromy O'Callaghan Lecture on women in the church with an esteemed sociologist of religion, Dr. Tricia Bruce. Dr. Bruce's award-winning books include Parish and Place, Making Room for Diversity in the American Catholic Church, and Faithful Revolution, How Voice of the Faithful is Changing the Church. Her edited volumes include American Parishes and Polarization in the U.S. Catholic Church. Currently, she is an affiliate of the University of Notre Dame's Center for the Study of Religion and Society, has led research for the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, and is a frequent public commentator on religion and society. I think my mother would be particularly happy to hear this lecture tonight. The lecture is entitled, Carriers of Catholicism, Agents of a Future Church. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tricia Bruce. Thank you so much for the introduction, and what an honor it is to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation to be a part of this lecture series. I had the pleasure and honor of reading a little bit about Anne Drummy O'Callaghan, and what an amazing woman, uh, and it is just a gift to be honoring her memory here today, too. Thank you also to Fairfield University and to the Center for Catholic Studies and this beautiful space. Uh, I, you know, I am someone who sings and plays guitar, so I'm gonna reserve the temptation to deliver my lecture tonight in song. Uh, so, but maybe later, we'll, we'll see how it goes. 
Do you recognize this place? I think all of us do, uh, and whether Catholic or not, I think many of us were riveted on that day in April when we turned on the, the news or the, the radio or the print media and we heard, oh my goodness, Notre Dame is on fire. And the images were gripping. And you felt the wrench, the heart wrench that that was. This place that represents in so many ways the ties of Catholics to their church, the church in the world. U.S. Catholics, too, right, felt that connection on that day. And, of course, we celebrated to find out that the, the church would, would survive. But there's, there's much to be said here about what's happening in this space. Probably, possibly, you didn't hear about this occasion. This is another church. Um, it's also called Notre Dame. Uh, it's actually a, a parish that is just outside the city of Boston in Worcester. And it's an old Canadian parish, um, French Canadian parish. The wrecking ball began swinging in September of 2018, taking aim at this near century old Notre Dame des Canadiens Catholic Church, and by implication, the community members failed attempts to save it. The Archdiocese of Worcester had suppressed the parish a decade prior, subsequently selling it to developers. Uh, it was dormant for years, and as plans materialized or didn't materialize, the structure began to fall into decay. A coalition of neighborhood activists mobilized to save Notre Dame under that name, Save Notre Dame Alliance, petitioning alternatives to a demolition that they labeled cultural vandalism. Heated city council meetings, court battles, fundraising, and petitioning to no avail. The church, as you can see here, was ultimately raised. The church in the center square of Worcester fell in a mushroom cloud of steel, glass, and dust. It will arise anew as City Square, a $565 million multi-phase project in the heart of Worcester that includes housing units, hotel rooms, and parking spaces. What is changing about Catholicism today? How do changes to the very structure of the church shape the agency and the work and the faith and the lived experience of those within? There's a lot that's changing about the Catholic Church. In the US context, it's a little bit misleading because if we look over time, we actually see some stability now, I'm a sociologist, so you'll see a few graphs, but not too many. This one comes from the General Social Survey. That, um, it's a pretty recent release. It came out in March of 2018. And this is looking at the line of the Catholic population. So what percentage of Americans do, does the Catholic population comprise? And it's about a quarter. It's been about a quarter for a while. It was about a quarter before. It was about a quarter some years ago. It's about a quarter now. Uh, in fact, the highest points that you see on this graph go up to about 27%, the lowest, 23%. There's a lot behind this line, of course. And there are trends in the larger religious landscape of the United States that also impact what Catholicism looks like. This line looks pretty different than the next line I'm going to show you. <laughs> That's right. Which, some, you may have heard this term before, the nuns. I'm not talking about religious sisters. <laughs> we might have some in the room. I hope we do. Uh, I'm talking about N-O-N-E, nuns. These are Americans who claim no religious affiliation. So if you ask them, what is your religious affiliation? And they'll say, nothing in particular. It doesn't necessarily mean they don't believe or they don't participate. They might even go to church. They might pray. It might still be important to them in their life in some way. But they're, they're going to say nothing in particular in terms of affiliation. The nuns are on the rise. 
the Catholic line, right, and the nuns on the rise. If former Catholics, if we were to depict that line here too, you start to see some of this coming together in a way. If former Catholics were a denomination in their own right, they would be one of the largest denominations in the United States. There are a lot of Catholics and there are a lot of former Catholics. Part of what we see behind this line is that who's included is changing. In fact, much of the exodus, those who depart, are white Catholics, many of them young Catholics, millennial Catholics, Gen Z Catholics. And the, the stability comes from a couple things. If you've ever thought about demography before, how does that line stay the same? It comes from fertility and migration, right? So if people are leaving, if they're leaving the church or what's the other way that they leave the line? They die, right? They pass on. So then you have generational replacements, younger folks, or you have fertility, people having babies, and migration. So part of the reason why this line maintains stability is that it's masking that kind of change. So who are American Catholics today? What does that look like? Who's the average American Catholic, if there is one, <laughs> right? Uh, and maybe we could argue that they're not. There are some substantial changes in terms of who's Catholic today. Um, Age-wise, Catholics are a little bit younger than average Americans, so um, especially when we look at Hispanic Catholics, Latino Catholics, who constitute a larger and larger proportion of the church. Um, on average, 49 years old. Um, racially, on average, still white, but I made the note that Catholics are increasingly likely to be people of color, and in particular, um, Hispanic Latino Catholics. Um, however, there's a growing population of Asian Pacific Islander Catholics as well, so still a small proportion, um, but this is a bigger part of the story here too. Catholics are more likely to be Southerners now. <laughs> you know, we, we ha probably have an image of the church that maybe is concentrated in the Northeast, um, closer to this part of the country. But the church has largely moved south and west in terms of population. Right? So more likely to be a Southerner. And the church actually has the highest proportion of foreign-born Catholics now than it's ever had, <laughs> which is a little bit surprising, right? You know, an immigrant church. But if we look at historically, um, in, uh, comparing to uh, the last 50 years or so, we are now at a higher proportion of foreign-born Catholics. And so a Catholic may be an immigrant or a child of an immigrant, probably married. Um, and then politically, we won't go into this. This would be a whole other talk. Um, but Catholics are pretty divided, right? It's, it's really about half and half, uh, Democrat and Republican. The other thing about um, Catholics, too, in this sort of change in the church, setting up this context, is that attendance and participation in the church is changing. Um, among self-identifying Catholics, the what we might call the core is shrinking and the periphery is growing. What that means is that the strongest Catholics I might use quotes around that, but the, but the Catholics who attend regularly, who, who have participated in all the, the sacraments regularly, who go to church weekly, this group of Catholics, the Catholics who are involved in the church too, in the parishes, is shrinking. And Catholics who affiliate but don't attend, or who have links to Catholicism, but don't participate in meaningful ways, those, that number of Catholics is growing. This maps onto trends that are happening in the American religious landscape at large as well. So if we look at something like religious attendance, so who's going to church, right? Or um, synagogue, you know, this is gonna include other faith traditions as well. Weekly attendance, again, pulling from that same general social survey. It's, it's you know, I mean, it, it, there's not a dramatic decline here, but you can see it's, it's ticked down a little bit. Where you see the more noticeable decline, though, is among those who never attend. Right? So people are less likely to attend religious services now. And like Americans overall, Catholics, about a third of Catholics go to church weekly. Right? So, there, so we can say most Catholics identify as Catholics but don't participate regularly, go, don't go on a weekly basis to Mass. Um, and so it, it, the core, again, the core is shrinking, the periphery 
is growing. So to state the obvious, the Catholic Church in the United States is changing. And the pace of this change is accelerating from within and from without. These massive structural changes are spawning internal change at what we could call macro, meso, and micro levels. So if we look at cities and communities, or a countrywide scale, or even a global scale, these macro lenses, if we look at a meso level organizationally, the ways that local groups organize, whether it's through parishes or otherwise, and on a micro internal level. Now, I mentioned I'm a sociologist, and sociologists are going to pay attention to the dynamics of, of power and groups and what happens at this nexus of all these different levels, right? You have these structural changes happening, and then what does agency or your individual power within that structure look like? The, you know, the, the subtitle of this talk is Agents of a Future Church, right? And when I read about Anne Drummy O'Callaghan, a brave and valiant woman, I thought, wow, what an agent of the future church. But this agency, right, it's, it's inscribed by structure, and I think we see that yeah, in her, reflected in her biography as well, limited by constraints organizationally, collectively. So the question then becomes, how does that change get managed and moved through the church, through the stu structures of this church? And I've used this term carrier, right? What carries the tradition? What do the carriers of Catholicism look like? And how does this internal change reverberate? I'm here to make a, a set of rather simple arguments on three levels. And this will allow us to kind of talk through some of these carriers of Catholicism at those different levels. One being that parishes carry Catholicism. Another being that communities carry Catholicism. And a third being that people carry Catholicism. I won't say individuals because I'm going to give a shout out to John Paul II and focus on persons, right? People, persons carry Catholicism. Because in fact, we're not really individuals, we're, we're always linked. So these things are really linked together. Much of my work is attuned to what I might call also the, the containers of Catholicism. So I've studied social movements and congregations and these different spaces, these, these organizations, these groups that contain religion. But those containers are shaped by those other levels and the way that authority works. So authority and the grassroots mix together. Another thing I thought of, too, um, even in, in thinking through these different layers is some of you, I, I don't know if this was your experience, but when I was a kid, um, of course, growing up Catholic, going to mass and sitting in church, and my mom, you know, trying to keep the kids quiet, and she would do that little hand rhyme with us, <laughs> you know, like the, um, let's see, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It's been a while since I've done this. It's like, the, here's the, the church, here's the steeple, oh yeah, open it up, and there are the people, right, okay? This is basically what we're talking about, okay? So, so it's the church, and there's even a material element to this too, right? The church itself, but then you have to remember the people. But look, it's all linked, you know? It's all, it's all together. So what does this change then look like? So with that first level, parishes carry Catholicism. <laughs> so we can talk about churches, parishes as carriers of Catholicism, and in parishes, there is growth and there is decline. But what a presence. Do you know, if you look at congregations, so here we're talking about not just Catholic parishes, but other type, you know, whether it's your Methodist church or your Jewish synagogue or whatever it might be, right? All that bucket of what sociologists would, would put in this camp of congregations. Um, even though that word fits parishes imperfectly. But if we take the full number of congregations, there are more congregations than there are all the top 10 fast food joints added up together and multiplied by three. Can you believe it? So if you take all the Pizza Huts, the Subways, the McDonald's, you, all those top 10, right? I know, me too. I totally agree. You put them all together, you multiply by three, 
you would still have more congregations. Now, I, I haven't spent too much time in the Fairfield area, so I don't know if it's the same here, but I'll tell you what, in Knoxville, in the Bible Belt, you know, you cannot throw a rock <laughs> without seeing a congregation, okay? These are meaningful places of where people do local religion, where people gather. In fact, they serve all sorts of functions it, that go beyond just the, the doctrinal or the worship component of it, which is huge, but they have social services, they have food banks, they're where you know, mothers have, have care for X, Y, Z, they're where young people meet their future spouse. <laughs> you know, congregations do a lot in communities. In 1965, there were 17,637 parishes. In 2018, there are just over 17,000 parishes. Actually, that sounds pretty similar, but here's what you don't see in that number. Again, the stability that's masking things. Okay, there are a couple things that are important to mention. It's like, that's fuzzy math. One is that in between those two numbers, it went up to 19 and a half thousand, right? So it, goes, it peaks, and then, so we've actually seen a decline in parishes in recent decades. The other thing is that there are a whole lot more Catholics now in the United States than there were in 1965. So you have fewer parishes serving a whole lot of Catholics. The Catholic population has grown from 54 million to 75 million. And we know also that the number of priests has gone down. So in part, what this is doing is supersizing parishes. Back to the fast food analogy, I guess. Right? You have, and sometimes priests are hopping from one parish to another, and you have these mega parishes that have thousands of people because that's just how it has to be done. Fewer parishes, more people, fewer priests, or alternative models of leadership, right? Who, what happens in parishes, and who does the work? Some of you may know the answer to that question already. <laughs> um, I, I, I edited a book uh, that came out this year called American Parishes Remaking Local Catholicism, and I want to just read this little piece from it. This is a, um, this is a chapter by Mark Gray, who was a uh, former colleague of mine at um, CARA, the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate at Georgetown University. And he writes, about 53.1 million Catholics attend mass weekly, monthly, or at least a few times a year. Most likely on, I bet you can guess, when, they, when do they go? Exactly, Christers, right? A and Ash Wednesday, we'll give them that too. Ash Wednesday, Easter, and Christmas. Um, some 38.3 million attend at least once a month. This population is similar in size to the 34.4 million who make regular financial contributions to their parish. Moving closer to the core, remember we talked about the core, the core of the Catholic population, there are an estimated 18.7 million Catholics who attend Mass every week. Near the very center, super core, you know who I'm talking about. Maybe it's you. There are 3.1 million Catholics who are very active in their faith beyond attending Mass. Within that population are more than 54,000 providing some aspect of parish ministry, including more than 39,000 lay ecclesial ministers, uh, professional paid and trained staff providing pastoral ministry at least 20 hours a week. Uh, last paragraph here. Extrapolating these populations to a per-parish point of view, there are an average of nearly 6,000 baptized Catholics when it, within a typical parish's boundaries, of which about 4,500 self-identify as Catholic. So the baptized versus the, so that's the departure, right? Some have left, some still self-identify. From this population, there are nearly 2,000 Catholics who attend Mass at least once a month, about 180 very active in their parish, and three who are involved in parish ministry. So these layers. Um, I, I noted also in reading about um, Anne Romeo O'Callaghan that she was one of these three. <laughs> so her bio that, that Joe shared, she said after uh, she moved into this parish, um, then she was involved in REACH, a religious education and Christian heritage, religion education program that did liturgy for children, volunteer of, with the children's liturgies, and she did youth ministry, sacramental coordinator, director of religious education, Emmaus retreat, and the list goes on, right? This is someone who was very involved in, uh, in the church, so one of these three. And indeed, women carry the lion's share of parish ministry. Women are more likely to be in the core than in the periphery. They're more likely to be involved in lay ministry despite the lack of access, or perhaps because of the lack of access to um, certain leadership positions in the church that are uh, the exclusive realm of ordained men. 
Uh, later leadership has supplemented priestly leadership in many ways. So what we see then is this shift. If we have these supersized parishes, smaller number of leaders, fewer number of priests, lay people stepping up and doing more, again, oftentimes women, who are in these leadership positions in the church. This is what, what's happening in the parish. I'm going to uh, share one other excerpt from a different chapter in this book. This is by Courtney Irby, who's a sociologist at Loyola in Chicago. And she writes about marriage ministry in churches today, comparing it to a, a historical context. She says, well, the primary lessons on how to have a happy and healthy marriage remain fairly consistent, kind of looking back and looking now. The carrier of that message at the parish level has changed, right? So who, get, who delivers that message now? Looking at who can speak on behalf of the Catholic Church reveals a shift in parish level religious authority. Um, just, I'll summarize this. Essentially, what she ends up saying here is that before, it was the priest who was doing all the classes preparing people for marriage, right? Now it's the lay people, the lay people who are giving it. And oftentimes, it's lay couples who are talking from their own level of experience, right? And how they're in their own marriage, they have learned certain things. So it's the, it's the lay people in parishes who are doing the work. Again, often the women in parishes who are doing the work. We see parish vitality in a number of ways. I mentioned the South and the West. This background image here actually comes from the cathedral in Knoxville, where I currently reside. And this is a brand new cathedral. Uh, this is kind of the side view of it. I have one more picture later. You'll see the front of it. This is where you're seeing the, the new stuff being built. Right? Ten this is in Tennessee, South Carolina, uh, North Carolina. This is where the new parishes are. Another source of vitality on the parish front and where this change in agency happens is through the model of personal parishes. Um, and these personal parishes, and this is this book that I wrote before is about personal parishes, which probably you've never heard of before, most people haven't. But you might have heard of national parishes. And this is like the contemporary version, right? So the idea of a national parish is that it serves a niche population of Catholics. So rather than being territorial or defined by geography, parishes are serving a particular group. Um, the new thing about personal parishes in a modern sense is that they serve other types of groups too, like those who want the traditional Latin mass or those who are interested in social justice. Um, there are all sorts of little creative versions of personal parishes that bishops have designated around the country, um, about 200 of them in recent decades, um, which, again, it's not a huge number. I mean, it's still a small proportion of overall parishes, but this is a way that the church is responding to this internal change structurally, right? sort of saying here's a structural response to this diversification that we see and the need for specialization in a special type of church. This particular one is um, St. Rocco's in Avondale, Pennsylvania. And um, this is a parish that was um, dedicated especially for Mexican Catholics. And the part of the reason it was dedicated is because there, were, um, there was an influx of Mexican Catholics in the area, in part because there was a growth of mushroom farming. And so the labor that that brought into the area meant that there were more and more people who were moving to the area, uh, many of them Catholic, and looking for a particular style of Catholicism, a, a language connection and whatnot. And embedded in this story, too, which I won't go into fully, but it's just to say that they didn't feel welcome elsewhere. They floated around to the other parishes and they were asked, they were treated like renters. When are you going to leave? Um, this is our space, this is not your space. So for better or worse, given that context, they received a beautiful new parish. This is a brand new parish um, and a brand new building that was dedicated specifically to their needs. Um, the personal parish concept, this comes out of canon law, um, so you can see where that, where that um, comes about. Most parishes are territorial, they're geographic, but personal parishes serve that niche population. So this is a form of vitality in the church. You know, the flip side of this, though, is that there are lots of old national parishes we could even say redundant parishes when, again, Catholics couldn't always get along. We'll say back in the day, right, sort of the early formation of Catholicism in the United States, and whether by language or culture or otherwise, everybody wanted their own church, right? 
if I'm Polish, I want my own church. If I'm German, I want my own church. And so we have all these churches. Um, fast forward now, we have fewer priests and these structural questions and what happens. You have excess churches, you have too many churches, you have to sell your churches. This is happening on a phenomenal scale at this point. A number of dioceses throughout the country are closing parishes. This happens to closing parishes and then having to sell their churches. This happens too because of the context in, that we've been in for coming up on a decade also of a you know, crisis of abuse in the church. Right? Um, and the, the, again, that shock that we saw on the day that Notre, Notre Dame burned, maybe there's a metaphor there, right? The shock that we felt when we heard these revelations of abuse in the church. Um, and so the scandals have likewise led to financial implications for many dioceses too. So there's a connected piece there. Um, and a number of these churches are now being sold. Dioceses like Allentown closed nearly half of their parishes between 2002 and 2018. So we're talking about very recent times. Hartford closed 90 parishes, which was 41% of their parishes. Dioceses like Buffalo, Albany, Camden. But also places like Indiana, Iowa, rural America, this sort of the shifting of um, populations. And so that's where you see some of these declines in recent years the number of US priests um, also in that same time period went down by 19%. Okay. So this is where it links then to this next carrier, which is the community as a carrier of Catholicism. And I pose this as much as a, an answer as I do a question, which is what happens when a church closes, right? You have all of these churches that have been built into the infrastructure of communities that do all these things that congregations do, as I described before, that go way beyond worship, right? They are nonprofits effectively, right? Immersed in their communities. What happens when they close? Like libraries and schools, Catholic churches and other types of churches are part of community social infrastructure. Um, and when it closes, then you have to ask these questions of what happens to it, how those decisions are made. Perhaps you've seen a closed church, whether Catholic or otherwise, that has become something else. I know I have many times. Um, in fact, this is from a project that um, I've been working on for about a year and a half or so, which is trying to trace both in the US context but also with a global comparative angle what happens to churches when they close and what does that say about how the, the role of Catholicism, the role of religion in the city and who are the stakeholders involved in that. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's ever been to these before, but the left-hand one, this is from, uh, this is in Pittsburgh. So next time you go, although some of you may not, it's, it's disconcerting, right? When I share this with my mom, she says, I don't, I don't like to hear this. Okay, there's one on the left is, is a, a former church in Pittsburgh that is now a, a, it's a bar. I'll show you a pic of, of the inside in a moment. Um, and and the, they've converted the altar to have the big, you know, the, the beer containers and whatnot. Um, the one on the right is actually in Scotland. Um, and it, you probably can't even guess from the outside, so that's why I'm going to show you interior pics. It's a rock climbing gym. And here's a picture of the, the bar on the inside of the Pittsburgh one. Hi. And I, you know, I'm attuned as a sociologist and ethnographer, a field researcher, I'm attuned to the sounds that you make, right? <laughs> I think that there's, there's probably a mix, right? You know, for someone it's like, whoa, no, you know, my mom again, like, ah, you know. But for others, you know, you go in, like, oh, this feels like a holy place, a sacred place, you know, what does it mean to, um, to, to go into a space like this? Here's one more. This is in Boston. Luxury condos. Religious buildings are exemplars of religious change. Right? This is at the nexus of congregations, of place, of community, of those levels of Catholicism that we talked about. This one's called the Lucas. It just opened uh, a couple years ago. It was once Holy Trinity German Catholic Church. This is one of these national parishes. Um, closed in 2008, um, sold by the Archdiocese of Boston, and then um, the partner, they partnered with an architectural firm to build this space. On this front, 
there is conversation on both a, a, I would say somewhat on a national level, but especially on a global level. In fact, I went in uh, November of 2018 to a conference in Rome that was sponsored by the Pontifical Council for Culture that was deeply concerned with the decommissioning of churches, right? What happens to churches when it's, they're no longer used as churches? And so they wanted to set up some guidelines, some rules, uh, and you can see there's a preference here for cultural aims, right? Use them as museums. You know, let's have an, an art gallery or, or a social aim, something that seems cultural or charitable. And there's a caveat that I don't quote here. It says, for buildings of lesser architectural value, transformation into private dwellings may be allowed. <laughs> okay. So there's, a, there's a, a, um, a conversation happening, but I would say it's a rather nascent one, especially in the US scene. Um, here is, is one uh, excerpt from an interview. I've done about 60 interviews at this point on this particular project. Um, but this is a woman, she's actually based in New York, who is a, a big thinker, developer um, type person and a Catholic. And she talks about basically the church is a property owner Right? And all of this landscape, this context that we just set up, all this transition means that there's an opportunity, a vision here that could be realized by transitioning that property into good use, right? whatever that good use or appropriate use may look like. And maybe you have some ideas and different dioceses are trying different things in meeting those needs. But this is one of these changes. And so the question then too is can the community carry or does the community carry Catholicism? Right? If, if it's not in the parish, if it's not housed in the church, the church, maybe the church is raised, like we saw in, with Notre Dame in Worcester. But maybe the church becomes a home for end-of-life care. Maybe it becomes a homeless shelter. Um, there, the diocese in um, Newark recently did a, uh, an exchange with a developer where they said, okay, we'll let you make the church into luxury housing, but we want you to build a homeless shelter next to it. So what does that look like, and what does that mean as a carrier of Catholicism? And then this, this third level, people carry Catholicism. We're not just talking about parishes and churches of carriers of Catholicism. We're talking about persons, about people, right? Remember the, the steeple, the people inside? Um, and I want to introduce you in this, in this last part here to three Catholic women who are carrying Catholicism today in different ways. Um, and I, I'll give you the context of these conversations since I've, I'm pulling together multiple projects that I'm involved in. And this particular project actually comes from a broad scale uh, study that I've embarked on over the past year, a national study looking at Americans' attitudes towards the issue of abortion. Uh, not just Catholics, all Americans, and we uh, created a sample that approximated the demographic characteristics of the U.S. population at large and then did a random address-based mailing and didn't tell people what the topic was until they went in and did the pre-screener. Happy to answer more questions about that. But we have, at this point, 222 interviews. And so what I did here is think through, look at that subset of Catholics, and in particular look at it, and the, these three women Catholics that I'm going to introduce here in order to tease out some of these ideas about carriers of Catholicism. Anne, and this is her pseudonym, um, and so we're no longer talking about Anne from the O'Gallion, it just happens to be her pseudonym that we assigned in the project, okay. Um, but Anne is an 87-year-old woman. She lives in Indiana. She identifies as a Republican, a pretty conservative Republican. She's middle class. She is a Catholic, and she, she's a lifelong Catholic. She describes religion as her core foundation. Um, and religion infused her life, both in terms of family and career. Um, she supported her husband's career as a railroad engineer. Uh, she, they used abstinence as birth control, uh, and they ended up having four children. The way she tells that story is kind of interesting, though. She says, uh, my first three children were born in three years, for three and a half years. And then I went a bit of time because I was strict with my husband and on a timetable. And, uh, time and then, and I'm just quoting Anne here. And then he lied to me, and I had my fourth child, which I was never happy about. <laughs> but, but what I wanted to point out is that she mourns now the absence of her children from the church. Because when she was raising them, she went to church with them. She went to mass with them. And she says now, again, she's, she's 87 years old now, she has children and grandchildren. She says, it gives me a lot of heartache because my children don't go to church. They'll come along with me, but they don't go on their own. And that's my biggest heartache. 
You know, when they were babies, they went every Sunday, but now they don't. And she, she blames this in part. She says, well, they, they married non-Catholics, and maybe that, that was part of it, but, you know, um, but you can, you can tell it pains her. And she says, the hardest part is my grandchildren. You know, my children were brought up Catholic, but my, my grandchildren um, don't have, as she puts it, don't have the foggiest idea. And she prays all the time that that will become important to them too. That's all I do. And she says, I know how they feel, and I believe in all that, and they have, and they believe in all that, and they, ha- they live good lives, but they just don't want the hassle of going to mass. I'm hoping as they get older, I'll change, but at the moment, that's not a possibility. Okay, so Anne is to identify, she's the weekly attending core Catholic, right, and has seen her children then move sort of from the periphery to, to beyond, and that pains her. Another woman, this is Maria. And Maria lives in Colorado, and she's 33 years old. Maria is a millennial, and she's uh, her daughter. She's the daughter of a Palestinian first-generation father. Uh, she identifies as an independent, fairly moderate, working class. Um, now, thinking through her own Catholic identity as a millennial. She, the, the interviewer asks her, well, have you ever moved away from the church? Have you come back to it? And she says, almost continually. You know, I never actually leave, but there are many times when I look at what I've taught and I have to pull it, untangle it, and see if what the, they're teaching is reasonable to me. It's always kind of a roller coaster. But then she comes out and she says, yeah, it's a tangled mess, but you know what? I don't think I'm actually ever going to leave the church. I, I'm here. In fact, she's very involved in the church. She kind of, she goes on, and you don't see the, the full transcript here, but she goes on and just talks about how much she loves the Mass. She loves prayer. Um, but she puts this tension forward. She highlights this tension. Maria is someone who does not have children and has no plans to have children. And she highlights this tension, this shift that she sees, that she observes as balancing, as a woman of faith, notions of family and career or ambition. And she wants to help in that tension because she or she's someone who has chosen, she does not, uh, she lives an abstinent life at this point. She does not want to have, uh, does not have plans, have children at this point. Um, but she understands what goes into that. And she says, you know, I think, I think we would see, and again, the context of this project relates to attitudes towards abortion, so this comes in as a theme. She says, I think we would have fewer abortions if, as a society, we were more supportive of giving birth, I guess, and of having children. And then a third. Daniela. Daniela is a uh, first-generation American. She grew up in Venezuela and a Catholic. And she's a peripheral Catholic. She does not attend church very often. She identifies as a Democrat. She has a master's. She's middle class. She's married. She says, you know, I grew up Catholic, but of course we didn't even talk about it in Venezuela. It's like everybody's Catholic, you know, it's not a thing. And she said when, when she spent some time in Germany and then she spent some time, now she uh, is living in Tennessee, all of a sudden it's a thing, you know, who, who are Catholic. Tennessee is actually the, uh, the least Catholic state in the United States. It usually, it, it volleys for number 50, 49 or 50 um, out, of, out of 50 in terms of uh, proportion of Catholics. So now it's a thing. But she says, okay, I'm, I'm still Catholic, and all of a sudden it's, it's more noticeable here. And she says, I did baptize my four-and-a-half-year-old as a Catholic when, well, when she was a baby. I'm planning to do the same with my, my one-year-old. And she says, and you almost hear this sort of hint of Catholic guilt in here, right? Well, perhaps I should. I don't go to church every Sunday. I go, you know, maybe three or four times a year on some specific occasions, right? We know when, right? Ash Wednesday, Christmas, and Easter. Um, and... We get into this conversation, um, Daniela and I do, I, I interviewed her, and she shares how while she was in Venezuela and she was in college, a sophomore in college, um, she had an abortion herself. And the way that she relays this story is in a in somewhat a matter-of-fact way, but then the words she uses, and you can hear this here, is she talks about how scary it was, in part because it was illegal. It was illegal to do it in Venezuela, uh, where she was living, and so she had to kind of, you know, go through the, the route that it, it was required to do that. Um, and she says how scary it was. It was terrifying. 
And she, the way that she explains it is that she says, you know, I had a particular vision for my life that focused on getting my master's degree, going into a career, uh, she's a, a science writer is what she does. Um, she's a very logical thinker. And this was not the vision that I had for my life. Um, and she says, when, in recounting the story, she says um, that she's never told her parents. And at the end here, I, I, I asked, did you later tell them? She said, I have not. I was 19, and now I'm 33. I don't think I ever will. So this, this tension, right, we have these, these three stories on the personal level here of Maria and Anne and Daniela. And this tension, then, of carrying Catholicism as a woman of faith while also carrying right, family and career tensions, right? These are these, this is where, again, that interplay of the broader structure impacts how people live and work within, right? We, we like to think of ourselves as free agents, especially within a demographic, democratic context of the United States, which we are, are privileged to live in, right? We have so many rights and freedoms. Um, and yet within that context, right, there are many structures that, that um, constrain us. And here these women are, are sharing their own interplay of that, that change and stability, how they carry Catholicism in different ways. Um, you know, does it carry on? Does it carry to children, to grandchildren? Why? Who left the church? Scores of other interviews, too, which I won't share with you about people who have left the church, sometimes related to the, to, to the issue of abortion, sometimes not, um, but who, who are likewise carriers of Catholicism in different ways. We can talk to you about cultural Catholics, right, who carry Catholicism but not in a religious identification anymore. These are the carriers of Catholicism, personally, organizationally, communally. Within this context of change, these are the agents, the future of the church, tethered in different ways, linked in different ways, given these broad constraints and changes that people within are experiencing. These kinds of adaptations are embodied, they're played out locally in congregations, in our cities, and I would say too in, in decision making as it's held by various stakeholders, right? We're the stakeholder of us, uh, we have various levels of, of dynamic and power within our local organizations, our communities, whether it's parishes or otherwise, um, and then beyond, right, on a broader scale too. So if we think about the future of the church then, what does that interplay look like? And how is Catholicism carried? Or is Catholicism carried? I think we can ask that question too on all of these levels. In the community, when we see a closed church, is Catholicism carried and how? Within the people that, that um, you heard from here and within these, the change in context of organization, how, um, what gets carried and maybe what gets let go too. Thank you very much for your time, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Tricia. I have a microphone, so those who would like to ask a question, raise your hand, please, because we want to be able to hear your voice. There we go. Bill. Thank you. Uh, did your uh, studies show any impact of uh, Catholic education. When I, when I was a boy, I uh, went to Catholic grade school and then to Catholic high school. They, they, the high school is still going strong. Uh, the grade school is closed. But has anything been shown uh, as, as to what you could anticipate as far as uh, uh, continuing in your Catholic faith? Great question, so I'll answer on two levels. One has to do with the material reality of Catholic schools, because Catholic schools are closing at an even more rapid pace than Catholic churches. Ironically, some of them are actually then sold and used as charter schools. So they, they go from school to school, but they, they change hands. And that shifting of the schools is putting pressure then on the parish system as it is typically um, set up. Now your question has to do more with identity, right? What happens 
happens if someone goes through the Catholic school system and then they leave? Or, or is the Catholic school system like a, a vaccine? You get just enough of Catholicism and then you realize, I don't, you know, I'm not going to do that. Um, and you hear, you hear both of those things, right? Um, you know, I, oh, okay, more close, thank you. Um, yeah, I, there is some sociological literature that is, is especially attuned to that, both at the K through 12 and at the college level. Um, I would have to look and see what the full effect is to be able to, to um, summarize it here. But I know that you know at the, at the college level too, this becomes a real question is, especially during a time of exploration, um, you know, is this, is this the time that, that people move away? One other thing that I'll say is that, um, in terms of life trajectory, oftentimes in faith practice, um, faith attendance and practice dips in like your upper teens and lower 20s. And then historically, it comes back, right? It comes back when you get married and when you have kids. Um, but that same effect is not being observed in the youngest generation now, in part because there are high levels of education, both among men and women, delays in childbearing, and in some cases, not getting married, too. So I think you put all these changes together, right? If you're educated in the Catholic system, exposed to a new reality, delaying your education in your church, then it, it, faith practice may take a hit, yeah. Is there any correlation um, did you find about the reason that uh, families might have left the church and the Urani Vitae, birth control uh, thing? Because I, I read statistics somewhere where um, like 98% of Catholic women had practiced birth control. Mm -hmm. And that, I wonder if there's a correlation about feeling guilty if they break the church law, or it has no bearing on why, since women basically, you know, get the family ready to go to church. Yeah, yeah. yeah of course, American Catholics have a, a strong, um, reputation, and that's em empirically true, of dissenting from within, meaning that they may disagree with certain church teachings, often around issues of sexuality and birth control, um, and yet still feel perfectly Catholic. You know, they're, they're, you know, they do all these studies over time that say, well, what are the most important things to being Catholic, or what does it take to be a good Catholic? And usually at the top of the list are sort of things like, you know, well, you know, having the Eucharist and believing what the Eucharist is and, um, you, know, the, you know, believing in Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. And you sort of go down the list and then birth control, you know, <laughs> it's lower down the list. So a lot of people think, well, you could still be a good Catholic, right? And not. Now, the other question, though, is that within the context of the rising the nuns and the, loose, the, the um, loosening of tethers to parishes and religious affiliations, I think what once was a default, well, of course I'm Catholic or I'm religious or I'm linked to religion in this way, is less and less becoming the default. So those dissenters, those questioners, right, might, you know, maybe it becomes a, um, a new form of available identity that, that is not dissenting from within. Um, and so that's, that, that a lot of this is generational um, because of course, humane um, vitae and the, the post-Vatican II, Vatican II and post-Vatican II Catholics look pretty different than younger Catholics today. Um, and the younger Catholics are the ones who, who are leaving. So I'm not sure that the model for them will be dissent from within because they weren't, for one, they weren't alive when that happened. Um, and, and they may not see the church in that same um, paradoxical way of being able to dissent from within. You ended with what gets carried and what gets let go. And I'm wondering if you could give us some ideas of what you have, whether it's based in sociology or intimations of what they are. Yeah, this is one of the interesting ways that this has come up is um, with the, the question of what happens to a church when it's no longer a church. And all, in all of the interviews that I've done for this project, I've asked the question of, what is a church? <laughs> um, and there are multiple answers to that question. Right? 
because what gets lost in part as you look around materially, structurally, infrastructurally. This is a massive impact on the Catholic Church in the United States and globally. I mean, the Catholic Church is actually one of the largest landowners, property owners on the globe. Um, by the way, the Catholic Church, of course, is not the only denomination going through this. Mainline denominations, so Methodists, Presbyterians, they're selling off a lot of um, a lot of churches too. So this this is a lot. So this is not being carried, right? So then the question is, well, what what goes in, or and and notions of the common good, or notions of service, um, like one of these, you know, well, it's it's not it's what you do, it's not what say, you say with your words. Is that a carrying of Catholicism? That's a little bit subjective, right? So the sociologist kind of observes, well, here this, here's this massive change. And then the question becomes, is this the persistence or the decline of religiosity? This question comes up a lot with uh, conversations about secularization. And for a long time, it's like, oh, secularization is happening. You know, God's out of this, the religious sphere. Except that people's levels of belief are still really pretty high. The United States is one of the most religious countries um, among industrialized countries in terms of levels of participation and belief. I mentioned the congregation stat. You know, religion is clearly still here, but it changes. It changes. And maybe in some of that change, something is lost. You know, you heard from the, the woman that I described at first the pain of the loss that was her grandchildren and children. And sheer numbers, it's people, it's affiliation is absolutely in decline. And I think that that, even though that level has been stable, again, a quarter of the American population, I have my eye on it carefully because right now, immigration and fertility is not offsetting as much as it used to, the exodus of Catholics. So on the bottom line, I think it's a, a, it's a shrinking church in many ways. You mentioned the, uh, the common observation that women are doing the lion's share of the work of administrators and ministerial parishes. So the question arises, um, to what extent is that economic, because these are often low-paying jobs, they have limited operability, they don't move more into the traditional breadwinner model, um, or to what extent is it spiritual? You know, are women more dedicated, more devoted, nurturing, whatever? Um, Sociologist, I don't know if you can answer that question, yeah. but I'll toss it out. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's a great, it's a great question. I would throw in here also that, um, you know, the the pay structure is an interesting one. The economic question is an interesting one because a lot of this work is unpaid. Um, this also happens, especially in uh, congregations or parishes that are predominantly people of color, where you have a huge number of unpaid laborers. So this is where the 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 work is being carried out. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly the, the women, I mean, if, if we use the example of, of um, Andrew Mio Callahan, who, whom this lecture is named after, it means people pouring themselves into work that is meaningful to them, right? That, pro that probably has a spiritual connection to them. There's a reason that it's happening. Uh, it, it elevates the question, too, of, well, I mean, the equal and opposite, so we're saying, are. Um, are those spiritual goods more available to some than others? Um, are other types of positions that may also be spiritually um, giving available equally to everyone? So I think those kinds of questions can be put on the table too. Um, as a sociologist, I will never be one to lean too hard on uh, nature versus nurture. I think a lot of it goes back to sort of the structures, the environments that we're in. Uh, women, again, oftentimes being involved more in caretaking and family practices, which may lend themselves um, to participation in the Paris. But the vast majority of families now, they're both working families. So this might be, this is another piece of the puzzle too, right? The church attendance piece. If you have two working parents, if they have kids or to um, adults in a, in a marriage who are, who are working because they have to, right? I mean, so, gosh, if you live around this area, it's like there, there's no way, you both have to work, then nobody has time to volunteer, even if it is your spiritual calling. Um, but, but why, yeah, why, why, who is there, why they're there, and how to keep them there, I think are great questions. It seems to me like 
probably the basic issue, well, one of the basic issues is power and, and education. As people have become more educated, they, they hold on to their own power, they make decisions, and so there's less willingness to say, even the church that I love tells me, this is what I have to do, and it's like, no, that doesn't make sense to me. And so I think it's, and then the power is, you know, with the men, and so women, a lot of us here have had very serious roles in the church, but it's still that the official power, if you will, comes from those men that tell us what to do, that, that really, and so I think that's the issue. I think that's why a lot of people leave, younger and older, that it's like it doesn't make sense to me to um, know in my conscience. I remember going to Catholic school and really um, getting lessons on informed conscience. And so if you really have taken that seriously and have informed your conscience, then you follow it and you do what you know is true for yourself with your prayer and with your education and yeah. Yeah, I, as a sociologist, I appreciate the, the question and the point about power um, and efficacy, right? So our ability to make a difference or have an effect. And I think I get back to the question of w women doing the lion's share of work in parishes, that's a place where they're having an impact, right? This is a huge, and in fact, if you look at the history of, of nuns, and, and part of the reason why many nuns became nuns is because that was an outlet and a way for them to have really high-powered positions, like over Catholic hospitals, over school systems. That was a place of, of efficacy um, that, they, that they could occupy. Um, and so a, a very good point. How does that translate then now um, to this new social reality that we live in? And what does that mean in this juxtaposition of faith um, and the, the desire for power and efficacy? How does all that balance? Yeah. Hi. I I want to talk about two parishes that I've had experience in. Uh, one is St. Jerome in Norwalk, and uh, this place was built back in 1960 as a school with a gym attached, and they were going to build a church, but until they did that, the gym served as the parish church, and it still does. And I remember my wife telling me years ago <laughs> that a uh, visiting priest came to our parish, and I think he was a liturgist, and he looking at the thing and saying, you know, if he were in charge, he would simply tear it down and start all over. And that annoyed her very much, because she said he had no sense of what had actually happened in that building in terms of the joys and the sorrows and all the wonderful things that had happened in that particular community. And I, and I guess the point of, of that is that the building, and we've got some lovely buildings here, but the building is not the parish. The people are the parish. And our parish, fortunately, has experienced uh, a tremendous uh, spirit, which I think is still, still functioning today. The other parish I wanted to tell you about is St. Madeline Sophie in Philadelphia. I grew up there, and that was built too as with a, a it was a very large building with a school, a large school, and then a church attached to that. Um, and I, I, that's really where I was formed as a, as, a, as a Catholic, and I'm very much happy about that experience. But um, some years ago, because of the demographic changes in the city, they clustered our parish with a neighboring parish. And then at some point after that, they decided, well, they didn't need to keep both places open, so they closed St. Madeline's. And then finally what they did was to put it up for sale, and they sold it. And you can find online a picture of the interior of the church 
with the high altar and the side altars and all of that. And then you can also find a picture of the church as it is today. It was bought by the Philadelphia Academy of Circus Arts. And if you look, <laughs> if you look at, the, at the picture, you can see the, the trapezes and all of that hanging from the ceiling of the parish. <laughs> so it's a lovely building. It's being put to good use, and I'm sure the people there will probably at some point or other feel some wonderful spiritual experience. I love those stories. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for the nice talk and all like that. Um, I'd just like to throw a question out, say, 20 years into the future. Okay. I have this awful vision and I hope it's not the way it all works out, but my awful vision is, well, you know, the Jews talk about the law and the prophets. I think that they're gonna be two Catholic churches, one based on the law uh, and traditional and all like that, and there'll be a second one of the spirit of the prophets, which will be very disorganized. A lot of people that are committed to the extent they can be, uh, but still keeping in touch. Uh, and then I see maybe another whole group that'll just merge into the, the general population or pick up whatever new things come along and all like that. So it, it seems to me that the, uh, the, the, the decline in numbers is likely to continue, that the type of Catholicism is likely to diverge. Anyway, that's, that's my dim vision, so. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's worth being attuned to that. You know, again, these moments of vitality and vibrancy, and what does that look like? Um, the personal parishes I mentioned. You know, the, the, a lot of times these first generation migrant parishes, it's, they're you know integrating like um, so. For example, a predominantly Filipino parish that has Simbangavi in the nine days before Christmas. I mean, you're talking about throngs of people. This very vibrant Filipino parish. Um, and then other parishes, we might say, oh, this is this parish is, is struggling. We cluster it with all of these other parishes. Um, and who gets to make that call and what happens to the church? It, it is, I think you're right to look forward to the future with some questions about what happens in that. Because in, in my mind as a sociologist, again, attuned to the dynamics of power, you think about both the grassroots what's happening, how people are owning their parishes, they're building, this is a very common model, right? You build the school first, you have church in the basement. This is an instruction even from bishops. Sometimes they even run um, bank, banks and loans, give loans to build a neighborhood around the, the parish too. This is how it works, so infrastructure building. Um, grassroots, but then you have these structures, right? These responses and the decline of priests or um, the, the ways that the, the model of leadership is built that can't, always accommodate both of those things. So far, the church has been a phenomenal absorbent of dissent and difference within, but many speak about, yeah, what happens if there are fractures and differences of opinion of what those outcomes look like, which might in fact look like, yeah, a pretty, pretty different kind of church or churches. So I'm gonna uh, draw this to a close, and I have an announcement or two, but before I make them, Will you please join me in thanking Tricia for her presentation. Uh, so uh, two announcements. So first, just a little commercial for the next event in the Catholic Studies program, which is next Monday. It's at 7.30. And it's in the uh, multimedia room in the lower level of the library where Father uh, Tom Fitzpatrick, the oldest member of the Jesuit community here, will be talking on that topic, beloved of the elderly, sexuality and prayer. <laughs> if you know him, you know that he's gonna say something really interesting and we have no idea what it will be. Uh, but he's very, very concerned to talk about this. It's a serious topic. I'm just joking a bit, but it's a serious topic. So 7.30 in the library, in the, uh, library lower level uh, on Monday, you can, you can get up close to uh, Father Tom. The other thing I want to announce is what we always announce at this point, which is we always announce the uh, speaker for next year. Some of you may have picked up the 
little flyer at the back that I prepared to, uh, uh, for her, but I think um, I can safely say that next, the next O'Callaghan lecture will be given by a millennial nun who is not a nun. <laughs> that is, she is a nun. She's a sister of St. Joseph. Um, she is a millennial. She's in her early 30s. Uh, her name is uh, Colleen Gibson. Uh, she was a student at Fairfield years ago, graduated from Fairfield as the valedictorian and the captain of the women's rugby club and went off to become a religious sister. She works in social work in Camden, uh, which is a tough place to be in New Jersey. And you know, for the first time I think in this series, it came to me that maybe it wasn't a good idea just to have academics doing these lectures, that it would be a good idea to have someone whose experience is somewhat closer to the person for whom this series is uh, dedicated. So Colleen Gibson next year, she's also, she's not just a social worker, you can say just a social worker. She's a writer and blogger and she's an excellent uh, presence and speaker and I hope you'll all put it in your calendars for October the 7th, the first Wednesday in October next year. So with that, uh, thanks again to, to Tricia, uh, thanks to, to Catherine for doing the introduction, I uh, thanks to all of you for being here. Now you know where we meet, you can come back. Thank you. Thank you.